the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff to turn into a serpent and you shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. He has allowed us to come together one more time. Put that down in the chat area that he has allowed us to come together one more time in this place we call virtual sanctuary. And I get so excited anytime we're able to come together because we know that God is not limited by space and by place that God is not limited by where we are worshiping or where we're learning or where we're studying from uh, because he's omnipresent, that he's where you are at the same time uh, as someone else is watching on another platform, that there is no way that dimensions can, can contain him, uh, that he's everywhere at the same time, that he is Jehovah Shamar, that he is there, the Lord is there, and that is the confidence that we have, that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I hope and I pray that you had a wonderful day, that you've seen the hand of God operating in your life and through your life. And if, if, it, if it seems like things haven't been working out for you um, this day or throughout this week, let me reassure you that God has given you a promise. What is that promise? First of all, the promise is that no weapon that's formed against you shall be able to prosper. That's a promise that's given to God, that he has assigned his angels over you to keep you. The second thing I want to say to you is that all things, yes, even the things that seems like they are hurting, all things are working together for good uh, for you because you love him and you are called according to his purpose. Tonight, I want you to join me in Exodus chapter 3. We're going to pray and get directly to our text on tonight. Father, we thank you that you have allowed us again to come into this place of virtual sanctuary. Tonight, open our ears that we may hear what thus says the Lord. Open our hearts that we may be receptive of your word. Uh, pour down every stronghold, destroy every yoke, lift every burden. God, let our hearts be set free. Open our ears that we may hear. And that we may be transformed to the image of Christ. Anoint us now for this hour and this moment, God, that we will receive the spiritual, um, the spiritual things that you will have us to receive. It's in Jesus' name we do pray and we give him glory. Amen and amen. Should you to join me and meet me in Exodus chapter 3? We will focus tonight on verse 1 through 6. In Exodus chapter 3, uh, beginning with verse 1, you will find these words. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, 
for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, we're in our series, Walking With I Am. And for a takeoff place tonight, I want to use for an idea. Any bush will do. Oftentimes, when we come to the story of Exodus, we are impressed upon by the movie, The Ten Commandments. It's in the Ten Commandments where we see this statue or this 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 actor who has become the epitome of what we think about when we think about Moses. That is um, Charlton um, Heston. We see we see him, and automatically when we hear Exodus, we think about the Ten Commandments, and we see Charlton Heston while he's on the backside of the desert, while he is tending to sheep, and we see him at the burning bush. And while that is good and it is it is great, um, I I want to make sure that we focus or don't get caught up in things that the movie portray and don't really focus on what the scripture is trying to say to us or what the scripture is saying to us uh, because we as human beings, as fallen creatures, uh, we spend so much time on the burning bush than on God because people are more fascinated with the spectacular than they are with the spiritual. Let me rewind that point for you again. That that oftentimes we spend so much time um, on the grandiose things, the things which are shocking, the things um, which are we consider to be uh, miracles, and 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 we spend so much time on that, um, and because it, it fascinates us. We are moved by signs and wonders, and we spend so much time on that, um, and we are so fascinated by it more than we are about the spiritual. Because when you are spiritual, you're not just moved by the spectacular, you are moved by God. Let me slow, slow down here and say that. When you are spiritual, you're not just moved by the spectacular. You are moved by God. That you are you are not moved by impressions. You are moved by God. That you are not moved because of excitement. You are moved by God. You are not moved by emotions. You are moved by spirit. And although you may have emotions, uh, you understand that your emotions change, but the spirit of God never changes. So you are moved by God. God. And anytime we are having a encounter with God, and in particular in this text, uh, we, we are able to witness through the text uh, a spiritual moment that has taken the form or has, has, or has been manifested in the way of the angel of the Lord. The Bible says that Moses is now on the backside of the desert, which means he's in a lonely place. He's he's by himself. He's on the backside of the desert. And and many of us struggle with loneliness. We 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 struggle with loneliness. We struggle being by ourselves. But Moses is on the back side of the desert. He's on the backside of the desert, and what he's doing, he's pasturing. He is pasturing sheep, which implies that he is continually by himself. It's not one accident uh, that he's by himself, but he is continually by himself. He's in solitude. And solitude is, is, is when you are by yourself uh, and anybody who's going to walk with God has to learn how to handle the solitude in their lives. If you're going to walk with God, if you're going to be spiritual, you have to be able to deal with those solitary moments inside of your life. Not only is he in a solitary moment, he's in, he's in silence. Because in the wilderness, there's not much noise. He's in a place where it is silent. So he in, he's in solitude and he is silent. So if you are alone tonight, uh, be ready to meet God for 
the place of solitude and silence that you are experiencing. Remember, Elijah, God was not in the earthquake. That is the spectacular. God was not in the fire. That is the spectacular. He was not in the wind, but it was in the silence. That Elijah heard God. And so Moses is on the backside of the desert. He's in the wilderness and he's in a place of solitude and he's in a place of silence. So anytime you find yourself in the place of solitude and you find yourself in a place of silence, it is not the time to become depressed. Put that down there in the chat. Say, I'm not depressed because I'm alone. It is not the time to come depressed. It is the time for you to be more in tune with what is going on spiritual than you've ever been before in your life. Because noise can move us in our carnality. Noise can move us in our flesh. But it takes silence oftentimes to heal the voice of God. It was in the silence. God spoke into the darkness where there was no noise and he began to create. So it's in the solitude, in the silent moments of our lives that we have to be more alert for what is spiritually going on. So Moses is on the backside of the desert. He's in solitude. He's in silence. He's not receiving no text messages. He's not receiving any messages on Instagram. He's not receiving any messages on Facebook. He's not receiving any messages on Twitch. He's in solitude. He has taken a sabbatical, not just a one year sabbatical. He has taken a 40 year sabbatical on the backside of the desert doing the same old mundane thing. He is pasturing sheep. He is dealing with sheep every day of his life. You ask Moses, what are you going to do tomorrow? Moses will tell you, I'm about to pasture some sheep. I'm about to go over the same routine over and over. This is a man who was the prince of Egypt. Now he's on the backside of the desert. He's left the life of fame where everybody was serving him, but now he's on the backside of the desert serving sheep. He's in a place of solitude. He's in a place of silence. And in that silence, the Bible declares, and the angel of the Lord showed up. It's, it's important. It's important that, that, that we see here. And he was led, um, um, he was leading the flock to the backside of the desert, to the mountain of God, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Let us stop right there. The angel of the Lord appeared to him. What is powerful and significant in our study tonight uh, is that it wasn't just any angel. It wasn't Michael who exhales in strength, who shows up. It wasn't Michael who shows up here in the text. It's not Gabriel who shows up. It's not even that fallen angel who called Lucifer who shows up. The Bible says it is the angel of the Lord. And anytime we look inside of the Old Testament and we see the angel of the Lord showing up, it's not Michael, it's not Gabriel, it's not the fallen angel called Lucifer. It is the pre-incarnated Christ. And the only way we can see Christ or the only way he was able to see Christ um, and see God was for, for, for God himself to take on the form to be able for Moses to see him in the natural. Because uh, we can't handle the holiness of God. We can't see God and live. The angel of the Lord appeared to him. So in his solitude, in his silence, he got a visitation from God. Let me say this to you, that in your silence, in your solitude is when you ought to expect to hear Jesus more. And I want you to notice that, that, that we, 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 we skip past, past the fact that Moses is in solitude, that he's, he's in silence. And we go strictly to the burning bush. But the fact of the matter is that, that even the God show up in the silence. And before the spectacular, that we know that he showed up in the place where Moses was alone. And during this pandemic, help me, Lord, huh, many people feel alone. They are isolated or they're social distancing from their families. They're social distancing from their friends. They're social distancing from their acquaintances. And they feel they're by their self. 
Tonight, I want to let you know that you're not in this thing by yourself. It is the most pivotal time in your existence up to now to be looking and listening for the voice of God in your life. The angel shows up. This is the angel of the Lord. This is the pre-incarnated Christ. God himself humbles himself in the form of an angel so, so, so that you and I can see and Moses can see, uh, we can see God and be able to live. And one of the first places we see God temporarily dwelling in before the tabernacle, here it is, right here in our text, the angel shows up uh, and one of the first places we see God dwelling in before he dwells inside of a tabernacle, before he dwells inside of a tent, the first place before he dwells inside of a temple, the first place we see God dwelling in. Are you ready for this? I hope your faith is strong enough to handle this. The first place we see God dwelling in, in the, inside of the text is that he's dwelling inside of a bush. That's nothing spectacular about the bush. That he decided to dwell in a bush. That's nothing spectacular about the bush. That is it's the fact that he decided to dwell in the bush. Because God is not limited to where he decides to reside. That God chose to reside inside of the bush. Now, up until now, Moses is 80 years old. And we have seen in the first three chapters of the book of Exodus, two thirds of Moses' life. He is an old man on the backside of the desert who's by himself, who is lonely. And Christ visits him and he visits him and take tabernacle inside of a bush. And what happens oftentimes, we move quickly to the fact that the bush is on fire. And God is not spending much time. When we look at this writing, Moses does not spend much time talking about the burning bush. What we need to listen for tonight, are you ready for this? Is that what we hear from the bush? That, that, that it's, it's not the bush which is of importance here. It's what we hear from the bush. That God blazing is an order, that, that God blazing inside of this ordinary bush, I need to say to you, does not diminish God's holiness. That God is holy, the bush says, because anytime we see the burning of flame, that the primary effect of, of fire is to consume. It is, it is um, the first thing is for it to consume. That is the very first thing for a fire to do. But after it consuming, the fire actually purifies. And so we notice here in the text uh, that the Lord descended uh, on an insignificant common plant, a common bush, uh, which is symbolic of that which is most humble and even despised. We're going somewhere tonight. And so the fire was not in a tall and stately cedar. It wasn't inside of an oak tree. It wasn't inside of a cedar tree, but it was inside of a bramble bush. For God chooses the weak and despised things of this world, um, like Moses, who's a shepherd. Like you who might not have no name, no title, no following, nobody listening to you. God chooses the things that seem to be insignificant to confound those who are wise, like Pharaoh and those in his upper court. And so any bush, God says to us, will do. So long as the bush, watch out, don't run into nighttime. Any bush will do as long as God is inside of the bush. And so this bush... The scriptures point out to us, the bush is not the significance of the bush. It's the significance of God. And don't get drawn away by or fascinated with the spectacular. Get fascinated with the spiritual. That this is not about God performing a miracle. This is about a spiritual moment. 
that the curiosity of Moses then is kindled and he turns aside, the Bible says, and he is searching for this strange thing which is spectacular. And sometimes God can use the spectacular to get our attention, but we can linger on the spectacular. We have to focus on God. Moses turned aside, the scripture says. He turns aside. He draws near to the place. He turns aside and draws near to the place where this bush is burning. Let me say this to you. Moses liked to play with fire. How do I know that Moses liked to play with fire? The reason I know that Moses liked to play with fire is that God only will use things huh, that he knows that we are attracted to to get our attention. Let me come up for air right here. That don't find it strange that whatever God used to get your attention is often things that you are already attracted to. That God don't use things that won't attract you. If he, if he know you're not moved by certain things, God will use what attracts you. On the flip end of the thing, if you think Satan will use your weaknesses and that Satan will use the things that he knows that make you weak, why don't you think God will use things that make you stronger or things that you like you like to use to get your attention? God used it because Moses liked to play with fire. And he saw the fire because it was something that he liked to play with. How do I know Moses liked to play with fire? It was Moses who was inside of Pharaoh's palace, huh? came out and he slew a man and hid the man and buried him. That was Moses playing with fire. It, it doesn't matter what type of fire it is. What it matters is that he liked to play huh, on the high side. He, he liked to play huh, on the edge. Moses liked to live life on the edge. In fact, in our text, we see he's moving the sheep to the backside, onto the edge of the desert. That Moses loved to live life on the edge. And so God used what will attract Moses to get Moses' attention. Now, now look here in the text. The text says that Moses um, said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why it is not burning. Now, curiosity, we know, killed the cat, huh? but curiosity got Moses closer to God. Because when you are spiritual, huh, you're not just moved by the spectacular, you are curious what's behind the spectacular. Only if we can get beyond the veil that we can stop just focusing on what is happening in the natural, but get to what is actually going into the spiritual realm. And God speaks to him out of the spectacular. He hears the spiritual out of the spectacular. When Moses saw it, the Bible says he investigated it. In other words, Moses saw revelation. But he didn't just take it at face value. He investigated what he saw. And when he began to investigate what he saw, God spoke to him uh, um, from an unexpected source. You have to be careful not to turn down people you don't know because God can always speak to unexpect or speak out of unexpected sources. God speaks out of this burning bush. And when Moses hear God speaking, uh, um, God, he, he, he goes to the bush to, to communicate with God. And so if we're going to walk with God, if we're going to be spiritual, we got to make sure that we don't try to um, uh, dismiss or remove our willingness to investigate that which we believe is spiritual. So God called Moses out of the supernatural and out of the invisible realm. God is in the spiritual. I hope you can see this. Uh, he's in the spiritual. Moses in the physical. But God talks out of the spiritual and his voice is manifested in the, in the physical. Okay, let me go this way. Moses does not see God. The bush is just a sign, a symbol of God there. Uh, um, um, he sees the burning bush. But he hears God. He sees the spectacular, but he hears God. And just because people are not moved by the spectacular, that doesn't mean they don't hear the spiritual. I'd rather for people to hear the spiritual than to be moved by the spectacular. It's not the spectacular that gets uh, that makes us grow. It's being able to hear the voice of God. Um, the, the, the 
Moses come near and he's seeking and he's he's he's, he's asking. He got questions. He's he's amused about what is going on and his conscience is not satisfied. And the Bible says God speaks to him when he began to come closer. Moses got closer and the Bible says so when Moses saw that he turned aside verse four and he looked God called to him. From the midst of the from the from the midst of the bus, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, "Here I am." Then he said, "Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off. Your curiosity, Moses, has brought you close enough. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you are standing, Moses, is an holy ground. God is speaking." To Moses help me God he is speaking to Moses and as he is speaking to Moses uh, many of us have abused this text here or we abuse the phrase that God speaks to us we have ran amok the idea that God speaks to us in fact God tells us in his word he hasn't spoken with anybody like he talked to Moses. When it comes to Moses, he talked to Moses face to face. It's not like anybody else, huh? but we are so accustomed to saying the Lord is always speaking. And, and God, yes, he does speak to us, but he doesn't speak to us the way he spoke to Moses. In fact, in Hebrews, I believe, chapter 1 and verse 2, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 says to us that long ago God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways and in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him that the son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So when God speaks to us, God speaks to us through Jesus. He doesn't talk to us like he talked to Moses when he saw Moses face to face. God speaks to us through his word. Notice here in the text, how do I know that when Moses heard God voice. God said, take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. Say, take them off your feet. It's holy ground. I'm the God of your father, the God of Isaac, uh, the God of Abraham, whether the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look upon God. Moses didn't run to social media. He didn't get on the phone and tell the folks, this is what the Lord said to me. What Moses did was hide his face and he fell as a dead man. God is not talking to us the way that he talked to Moses. God is talking to us through his son. He is talking to us through Jesus. If God was still giving us new words, then the Bible, the canon is not closed, it's not sealed. It should be an open canon where we should be adding to the canon. But because God decided to speak to us through the, his son and he closed the book, uh, he's not talking to us as Moses. Be leery of those who say that the Lord is speaking to them as if it's something new that every revelation God wanted to give to us, he has given to us through his son, Jesus the Christ. We got to get up out of here soon. And so Moses, the Bible says, God said, take off your shoes for the place you stand is holy. What makes the place holy? It's not the bush. It's not the material in the building. It's, it's, it's not the clothes on your body. It, it's, not what, what, it's not the material stuff. It, it, it's not what makes it holy. What makes it holy, the place where Moses was, is that God is there. What makes the moment holy is that God is dwelling there. What makes you and I holy? It's not what we wear. It's not the clothes we have on. It's the fact that God is inside. God said, I'm not no longer going to dwell in buildings. I'm going to dwell inside of you. That's what's going to make you holy. That I'm going to put me inside of you. I want to dwell inside of you. That you are the temple of God. That you've been bought with a price. 
He says, Moses, I need you to take off your sound. And you have to understand in, in the ancient Near Eastern time that, that anytime someone took off this sound, it was symbolic of what they would do anytime they saw a king. And God was telling to Moses, you're not talking to anybody. You're talking to the king of kings. I need you to take off your feet. It was a sign of reverence. This was a sign of respect that we have to get to the place. Now, let me say this to you. It matters how you come to worship. That we are there in an age where, where, where people treat God as common. God said to Moses, you can't treat me as common. You got to take off your shoes or off your feet. You got to show me some type of reverence, some type of respect that you ought to enter into my presence with reverence. That this is not play moment, Moses. This is not social socializing moment. This is time for you to come into my presence with thanksgiving and to my courts with praise. David said it this way. Who can ascend into the hills of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart that you just can't come to the Lord in the rain where you have to come with respect. Take your shoes off your feet. And matter of fact, the, the, the closest thing we might see with ancient Near Eastern time about shoes is that you remember when President Bush, I told you in the Bush would do, uh, when President Bush was over in the, in, the, in the East and a person took off their shoes and threw it at him, it was a sign of disrespect. They didn't reverence the president. God said, Moses, take your shoes off. Don't throw them at me. Take your shoes off uh, and show me reverence. <laughs> don't, don't disrespect the fact that you have engaged holiness. You have engaged the presence of the, of the Lord. You have engaged a place that you have never engaged before. And I want to say this to you tonight. The, the place where you are is a holy place. It's not holy because you got incense and things burning and you got music playing. It's not holy because uh, um, um, the idea of, 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 of what's inside of the room, what is holy about the fact is that God is dwelling in you. Know tonight that God sent his spirit to dwell inside of you. It wasn't in your loneliness. Know that God is there. When you feel in, you're isolated, know God is there. When you are intrigued by what excites you, know it's only God's getting your attention to speak to you. He wants to speak volumes to you in your life. That you are not alone during this time. You have never been alone. He's always been right there. Always. That nothing can separate you from the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. He loves you. He loves you. So that's right. Just like the ordinary bush. What made this moment so spectacular is that God chose to show up. My hope and prayer tonight is that you experience this power and presence of God like you've never experienced it before. That you get to see and that you hear that God chooses to speak with you. Yes, in the times where you feel like you're in a dark moment, those are the times where you need to be more in tune to what may be going on spiritual. That God uses our loneliness to speak to us. Jesus oftentimes went aside by himself into the wilderness to pray, to meet God. During this time, it's my hope and prayer that you've turned aside to meet God. Don't get, don't, don't get bombarded with all of the news on all of the chattering, but it's in the silence where we can meet God. I want to pray for you tonight. Lord, I thank you for my brother and my sister who is tuned in tonight. Ah, I pray that your power, our God, in your presence, God will awaken them. That they will become conscious that you are there. And knowing that you are there, God, is enough. Knowing that you are present is enough. Bless us now in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. And a man. Now for everyone else, I'm going to ask you to prepare yourselves for giving tonight. The 
Bible says we ought to return tithe and we ought to get offering and we ought to sow seed unto the King of Kings, unto the Lord of Lords. For God blesses a cheerful giver. He's able to make all grace abound towards you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. It is my hope and my prayer as we leave this place, this virtual sanctuary, but never God's grace, that the Lord will bless you and keep you, that his face will shine upon you and be gracious unto you, that the Lord will lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. It's in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen and amen. Go out and have a blessed rest of your evening and have a blessed day tomorrow. God love you, and we love you to life. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not leave them on the road to the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle.